part of the chapter that I want to focus my sermon on was in Esther uh, 8, verse number 11, the Bible read, Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. And the title of my sermon this evening is, The Best Defense is a Good Offense. The Best Defense is a Good Offense. Now, on March 31st, we've uh, formed a strategy, we've formed a plan to have a, a mega soul-winning marathon, where we're going to have, in virtually all the provinces of the land, in all the different states of the United States, not only in the states, but also in the entire world, Places where Christians are going to come together and they're going to do what? They're going to do battle against spiritual wickedness. They're going to stand for their life. They're going to destroy. They're going to slay. And they're going to cause to perish the enemies of soul winning. They're going to show, hey, soul winning is what we need to be doing. It's the work of the Lord. And we're going to destroy a lot of what? False doctrines. We're going to destroy a lot of naysayers to soul winning. We're going to destroy the enemies of those that would want people to be saved. And I have four enemies tonight that we're going to look at, four opponents that we're going to see destroyed. And I'm going to use this story as a spiritual application. Whether you, you know, agree with everything that happened in the book of Esther or not isn't as important, but we're going to take this example, this verse, and see some of the things that they did because in reality, when you're not willing to take a stand for what you believe, when you're not willing to fight for yourself, the enemy will many times take that away from you. They will destroy you. You have to fight for what is yours. You have to, there's a battle. And whether or not you want to be in the battle or not is not important. You have to realize the enemy wants to slay you. The enemy wants to take that away from you that's, that's good and holy and righteous. They want to take your life. The Bible says the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. There's a person that's against you tonight. And what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit at home? Just, oh, I hope he doesn't come. I hope he doesn't come to attack me. I hope he doesn't come to slay me. You know, I'm sick and tired of Christians just being on the defensive all the time. Why don't we get some offense going on? Yeah. Why don't we go out and attack false doctrine? Why don't we go out and attack those that are enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ by preaching the gospel, by getting people saved? That's what this world needs. You say, I want to combat spiritual wickedness in this country. America's going to hell in a handbasket. America lifts up filth and sodomy and wickedness and fornication and drunkenness and all these things. How are we going to go to battle? We're going to go to battle by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, by preaching people to believe on Jesus Christ, to get into a good church, to live for Him, to serve Him, and get the sin out of their life and become a soul winner too. You know how you're going to encourage people to be a soul winner? By going out and being a soul winner yourself, by leading by example. A true leader is not one that just gets up and talks a big talk. No, he goes out there and he does the work. He's the one that goes out before the people and he comes in after the people. He's leading the charge. He's taking the, 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 the reins. He's going out in front. We see him taking the charge, doing the great exploits, and we can follow his example. That's what a leader does. But go to Ephesians chapter 6. My first point comes from that verse where it says, we need to stand for our lives. You need to be willing to stand for your life. And the most, probably the biggest opponent of soul winning is yourself. Is you just deciding in your own heart that you want to take a stand. You want to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to take a stand for the gospel. You want to take a stand for that which is eternal rather than just walking in the flesh. Rather than just gratifying the lust of the flesh. Rather than just being a pacifist, as it were. The Bible says in Psalms 94, verse 16... Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? And who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? The Bible says God's looking for somebody to stand up against wickedness. He wants somebody to stand up against all the filth and the workers of iniquity in this world. To stand up against the presidents that, you know, praise abortion. That praise feminism. That, you know, they praise all kinds of wickedness in this country and all kinds of filth and smut. We need somebody to stand up and say, no! The Bible says, no! The Bible says, thou shalt not kill! And abortion is murder. I don't care what anybody says. It's murder. We need people to stand up against iniquity. But look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand 
against the wiles of the devil. Notice it doesn't say sit. Notice it doesn't say lay down. No. In the Christian life, you got to stand. You got to be a worker. You got to do something. You got to do something with your life. Don't just sit around all day. Take a stand. Why sit we here till we die? Let's take a stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I don't even have to make my own point. The Bible's just making it for me. It's like, you got to stand. you got to be willing to stand. Hey, why don't you stand for what you believe in? Why don't you have a spine? Why don't you be a man and actually stand up for the Bible? Stand up for the Word of God. Stand up for truth. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for holiness. Why are we... You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, is what Paul said. If you're not ashamed, then you should be willing to go out and take a stand. Say, hey, here's an evil day. I'm going to go out and stand against it. I'm going to preach the gospel to every creature. I'm going to go out and make a difference. I'm going to be one that stands for my life. Go, if you would, to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua 23. The Bible says, though, in Matthew 13, talking about the parable of the sower, and it says, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The Bible says, why would someone not take a stand? Why would someone not want to preach the gospel? Why would someone not want to fulfill the great commission that Christ has laid out for us when he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why would someone not do that? Well, they get choked up with the cares of this world. They get choked up with the pleasures of this life, with money with TV, with sports, with family, with friends, with going on the lake, with going out and doing hiking, do whatever. Whatever it is, there's always an excuse. There's always something else to do. Look, even if you just did all the things you wanted to, there'd be plenty of fun things that you didn't even do. I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities for you to have fun and to choke out the Word, to choke out the Word of God with all the pleasures of sin. And you know what that will happen? You'll be unfruitful. You won't take a stand. You'll be too busy. You'll be distracted. You'll be sitting somewhere watching a ball game, sitting watching the football game, sitting watching other people live their lives. No, we need to take a stand as Christians. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, wherein two that are also called and hath professed a good profession for many witnesses. Paul's saying to Timothy, Look, you've got to fight! The life of a Christian is one who fights, who's willing to take a stand. Mordecai and Esther, they did their part, but look, they can't travel the whole world and fight for you. At some point, you got to fight your own battle. you got to say, hey, this is my town, this is my area, this is my neighborhood, and I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight the good fight, though. I'm not going to get worried about fighting flesh and blood. I'm not going to get all tangled up. I'm not going to go fight all the politics. I'm not going to go fight, you know, the police officers. I'm not going to pick all these physical battles. No, I'm going to fight the good fight, a spiritual battle, by going out and preaching the gospel. That's how you fight the good fight. Deuteronomy chapter 7 makes a warning, though, when you don't fight. It says, well, what's the point of fighting? Like, I just want to live in peace, you know. I just want to be at peace with all men. Well, that's taking that out of context. But in Deuteronomy 7, verse 16, it says, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eye shall, not, shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. Now when the children of Israel were leaving the Egyptians, when they were leaving Egypt, they were going to inhabit the promised land. But there were already people there. And the Lord told them, you need to slay all of these people. Every single one. And he says, if you don't, if you're not willing to fight, they're going to be a snare unto you for the rest of your lives. They're going to be like a thorn in your side. They're going to constantly be pestering you and, and, and taking your land away from you and harming you and taking your children. I mean, that's what we see when you won't fight the enemies of God, when you won't fight against false doctrine, when you won't fight against the clear things of the Bible, you're going to suffer for it. 
If you just sit idly by, you're going to lose your children. You're going to lose your spouse. You're going to lose all the things that matter to you in this life. You got to take a stand. You got to fight for your life. You got to take that stand. Look at Joshua 23, verse 8. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Else, if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. There's no neutrality with the Lord. Yeah. Look, you're either going to destroy your enemies and live in peace and prosperity and have the blessing of God, or you're going to let your enemies exist around you, and they're going to come and do what? They're going to be a snare unto you. They're going to trap you with all their, you know, uh, TV, with all their music, with all their lusts of the flesh. They're going to trap you and ensnare you, and they're going to take you, and they're going to end up scourging you with the sin of all their wickedness. And then there's going to be a thorn in your eye. You're not even going to like what you see anymore. Not only that, you're going to perish eventually off the land. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to perish. Nobody wants to have all these sufferings and afflictions. But the person that wants to sit idly by, they've already made their decision. That's what's going to happen to them. You've got to fight the good fight. You've got to take a stand. And when it comes to soul winning, your biggest opponent is yourself. Your biggest opponent is you deciding in your heart, what are you going to do? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the Lord? Are you going to love Him? Well, if you are, you got to go to battle. You got to put on the whole armor of God. You got to be willing to take a stand. You say, "Oh, why are you preaching this?" Well, look, there's a lot of enemies of the gospel. There's a lot of people attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ, attacking what the Bible clearly says about faith alone, that we're saved just by faith, attacking soul winning. And if you don't address the enemy, if you don't fight the enemy, guess what? He's going to cause you to perish from the land. Do you know what we need to do? We need to preach against them by name. We need to call them out. We make it clear what their doctrine is and fight with the Word of God. Fight with God's Word, not man's wisdom, not a physical battle. I'm not going to go out and just fight the enemies of, of the gospel with my fist. No, I'll fight them with God's Word. And I'm going to go out and preach the clear gospel and get people saved. That's how I'm going to fight them. Go to uh, John chapter 1. So first point is what we got to stand for our lives. But not only that, it gets, it gets better. we got to destroy. You say, what are we going to destroy? When you got soul winning, is it, you know, we're just preaching the gospel. We're preaching the good news. What are we going to destroy? You know what we destroy? When we're going to go out in this epic soul winning marathon, this mega marathon, this day to be remembered... We're going to destroy Calvinism. Yeah. We're going to destroy that lie from hell of unconditional election. But you know what? Going out with thousands of people preaching the condition of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, right. That's how you get saved. It's not unconditional. It's not just God just has a tractor beam and just selects certain people to be saved and damns other people. That's a lie. Right. Now, according to the Bible, if thou believest with all thine heart, the Bible says... Thou shalt believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Look, it's not unconditional. If thou believest in the heart, then thou mayest. The Bible makes it clear. Look at John chapter 1, verse 13, though. This is one of their proof texts of how it's unconditional. They say, Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, to get some context, because they'll never give you any context. They'll just give you, like, a part of a verse and then try to tell you, oh, it's unconditional election. They want to say here in that last little phrase, nor the will of man, well, it's not by you deciding to get saved. It's just of God. God just decides for people to get saved. God's just the one that, you know, elects people. But wait a minute. Let's just read a couple other verses surrounding it. Let's just back up a few verses. Look at verse number 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus Christ. We're talking about God. And he says, And he came unto his own, 
and his own received him not. Right. Now let's look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So did everybody that received him get saved? Well, it says it specifically, even to them that believe on his name. He's making it just specific. Hey, the people that received him, they heard the word, but as many as believed him, they became the sons of God. As soon as someone believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they become his son. But those that do not receive the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not the sons of God. Now he, he finishes that thought with what? Which were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And you say, well, what does that mean then? Well, not of blood, that means it doesn't matter who your parents are. Yeah. Salvation is not based on race. It's not, I don't even believe in race. There is no such thing of race according to the Bible. He's made of all bloods one nation. Or, or, so the Bible makes it clear. There's, look, we're all the same blood. There's no, you know, uh, just because someone has a darker skin color or darker hair color or is taller or whatever, look, we all come from Adam and Eve. And even better, we all come from Noah and his wife. Because, I mean, basically, we have two different uh, sets of parents that everybody descends from. But the Bible makes it clear, look, we weren't born into God's family by who our parents are. It's not by being Jewish. It's not by being a Gentile, especially. It's just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, it's not nor the will of the flesh. What does that mean? It's not of works. It doesn't matter how you live your life. That will not save you. How you live your life has no determination on who your parents are. I, how I live my life or how I obey my mom and dad does not determine if they're my parents. The same thing as the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not based on the works of your flesh that you get saved. It's based on your faith in Jesus Christ and He performs the salvation. He gives you the free gift of eternal life. He's the one that quickens your mortal spirit. And you say, well, yeah, but what's the, not the will of the man? Look, it's not based on how willing you are to get saved. So some people will take this middle road and they'll say, well, you got to be willing, you know, to turn from your sins. you got to be willing, you know, you got to really want to be saved. And there'll be these people that'll say, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I don't know if I wanted it enough. Look, it's not how hard you want to be saved. It's just putting all your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the best way I illustrate this is I say, look, if you're on the top of a tall building and they were on fire and there was no escape, but then a fireman came down along and he says, if you jump down, I'll catch you. Do you believe me? Now, when he says that, he's not saying acknowledge I exist. He's saying, you know, if, if you jump down, I'll catch you. Do you trust me? Right. He's asking for you to trust him completely. Now, some people, I may preach them the whole gospel. And I've used this analogy in my gospel earlier. And they'll say, well, I'm just not, I don't know if I have enough faith to be saved. And I say, look, you don't have to have a lot of faith to be saved. It's not how much faith you have, but you have to put all of it on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? I said, look, let's take two people. We go back to the scenario, the guy's on the roof. One guy jumps down with a lot of confidence. I mean, he has tons of confidence. I mean, he does a backflip off the building and the fireman catches him and saves him, okay? He's saved. But let's take another person, the lady. She's up there. She's pretty timid about it. But you know what? She jumps off with her whole body. They're both saved. It wasn't based on how willing or how confident or how much they thought about it. No, it's just by putting all your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with the faith, the grain of a mustard seed, thou could say to this mountain, you know, be cast in the sea and it would obey you if you believed. So according to the Bible, it's not based on how willing you are to be saved. Look, obviously, you have to call on the name of the Lord. You have to be obedient to the gospel by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not based on how willing you were. It's based on you just putting all your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by the will of man. You can't will yourself to be saved. You can't, I just really want to be saved. Oh, I'm saved. No, it's not like, what is that, Dragon Ball Z? They have these guys, they, they sit there and they scream, they're like, Aah! and then they like explode into some other person. It's not you willing yourself, oh, I just really want to be saved. Save me. No, it's you just putting your faith on the Lord. It's simple faith. The faith of a child. The faith of a child saves. It's not based on how willing you are. But they want to take that verse out of context and say, oh, this verse says it's not by believing. Just ignore the, the hundred times the, the book of John says it's by believing on Jesus Christ to be saved. This one verse that says it's not by the will of man, oh, that disproves that we're saved by faith. Lie! 
Now there's this big false teacher of this. His name's John Piper. Yeah. Yep, right. This guy is just a, a complete heretic. Man. He's unsaved. He doesn't understand the gospel. He has five reasons why we should embrace unconditional election. They're all stupid. The first one is, we embrace unconditional election because it's true. Now, at that point, we're true. I guess he has some valid. I mean, if unconditional election were true, I guess they'd believe it. That's not a compelling case, though, because it's false. Now, he says, I'll, I'm not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time, but he says, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. Now, go to Romans chapter 9, if you would, for a second. Let's understand this for a minute. The Bible makes it clear that we're saved by our faith. But they want to take some cryptic passage in Romans chapter 9 and twist it and try to say, well, this is saying that you know we're saved by unconditional election. Later in his uh, paragraph of heresy, he says, in other words, God's original purpose in choosing individuals for himself out of Israel and all the nations was not based on any conditions that they would meet. It was unconditional election. And thus he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on who I have compassion. And then he just puts some quotes about Romans 11 and 15 and 16. So let's turn to Romans chapter 11, or yeah, Romans chapter 9, verse 11. It says, and this is where they really love this, this portion of Scripture. It says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said in her, the elder shall serve the younger. So he's saying, look, it's not of their works, it's just of God. It's just of all of his purposes. And this is what they'll try to say. They'll say, not only is it not based on any condition before, it's not even based on their for God's foreknowledge of their actions in the future. That's why he says it was not based on any conditions that they would even meet. He's saying, look, there's literally nothing Determining whether or not God's going to save people or not. Yes. He's just saying, you're damned, you're saved, you're damned. I know I wrote a whole book saying, if thou believest, but it was just a joke. Right. I was just making it up. Or, I didn't really mean that. What a liar. Amen. But if you just back up to Romans chapter 8, and you actually get this in context, we see that every time God talks about election, He talks about it with foreknowledge. He talks about the fact that He knows the actions that we're going to do before. And that's why he makes a lot of the decisions he does. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Being called, right? Election, right? Look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So look, they were called. What does called mean? So the same would be election. Election means to choose. We think we elect a president. You elect a governor. What are you doing? You're choosing someone. To call someone means you're, you're calling this person. Hey, we're going to call this person to be, you know, the leader of the church. Or we're going to call this person to do some kind of business. Or we're calling, you know, this brother to be this missionary. We're choosing him. We're selecting him. He's saying, look, in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow. What is foreknowledge? It means he knows them. Now, I'm not going to for sake of time go there, but Matthew chapter 7, yeah. when he talks to the unsaved, when he talks to those that are trusting in the works to save them, he says he never knew them. Right. Now, he knows all those that would believe on him before they even existed. He has the foreknowledge, and he predestined those that believe on him to be the elect, to be the ones he would call. Now, you say, well, what about the whole mercy, you know, have mercy, and have compassion, and have compassion? Look, my children will always be my children, okay? But let's say that my children, they both committed the exact same sin, or the same trespass against one of my companions. Don't I, as a father, have the right to give them different punishments if I want to? Yeah. Couldn't I say, well, this one's a little bit older and has a little bit more understanding, so he's going to get a harsher punishment than the younger child that doesn't really know. He was just kind of following his brother. And I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Is that, that's my decision. But are we talking about salvation? No! We're talking about how God's going to choose for people to live their lives. Look, not everything is fair in the Bible. 
Some people are raised with godly parents. Yeah. Some people live with an atheist pet, you know, parent. Yeah. Some people live a hard childhood. Some people live a great childhood. We have all different walks of life. God chooses all of these things for us. I mean, He's the one that creates, creates us in our mother's womb. But it has nothing to do with if you're saved. He wants all men to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. Now, for sake of time, I'm not going to finish the rest of this chapter. If you read it all in context, it makes it very clear. Look at uh, chapter or 9, verse 22, though, real quick. We'll look at a couple more verses. It says, What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. So he's saying, look, not are we just talking about Jews, we're talking about us. All of us. And the book of Romans is written to Gentiles. He's saying, look, all of us, we're called. Why? Because we were foreknown. And we were predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son by believing, because we were going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now the interesting thing is he talks about how he uh, loves Jacob and hates Esau. But the thing about it is Esau was the firstborn. So by birth order, he was supposed to be you know, the chosen or the called or the one that's supposed to be the one to get the inheritance. He's the firstborn. But we see Jacob gets it by the promise of his father, the blessing that he gives on his father. We see Ishmael. He's the firstborn. But it doesn't go to the flesh. It doesn't go to the firstborn. It goes to Isaac the second, the child of the promise. We see the children of Israel, guess what? They're not going to get it. It's going to come to the Gentiles. Right. Why? Because of the promise. We see that the calling was known on foreknowledge. It didn't go based on the birth order. It went based on his foreknowledge of what was going to happen and the decisions they were going to make. And it says, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. He said, look, the physical descendants, they're not going to be the ones that are going to you know, embrace Christ the most. It's going to be the Gentiles that are going to receive it. And he goes into Romans chapter 10. He said, look, I wish that the uh, Jews would be saved. I wish that my Israelite fellow brethren would be saved. But they sought it not, you know, by his righteousness, but by, by their own. And then he goes in how you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Earlier in the chapter, he says they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. He's making the point that, look, just because God would uh, foreordain something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's a talking about physical salvation. It's talking about the spiritual salvation. Okay, we see different people changing even the birth order, right? By promise. Now go, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 1. You say, at the end of that chapter, I'll just read for you, it says, Wherefore? You say, why did they not receive it? Because here's the thought. They say, well, the reason why he loved Jacob and hated Esau was based on just God's purpose. Just God's decision. Because that's the whole point they want to make. It's unconditional. Well, at the end of the chapter, he makes it clear. He says, wherefore? Why have these things happened to them? Why did Pharaoh get raised up and destroyed. Because they sought it not by faith. God knew that Pharaoh was going to reject him. God knew before he even did it. He said, look, Pharaoh's not going to let you go out but by a strong hand. So why did he raise Pharaoh up? Because he knew that he was not going to believe on him. And he was going to have this guy harden his heart so much that he could perform his great miracles to make his power known. Yeah. To make him sure. That's why he picked Pharaoh. Why did he pick Abraham and the Bible? Think about this now. In, in Genesis chapter 18, we won't turn there. But in Genesis chapter 18, they're walking and they're, he's about to contest with Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord said, look, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, should I show this thing unto Abraham? I'll read for you. He says, uh, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Why did he choose Abraham? Because he knew Abraham, and he knew that he was going to do right. He knew that he was going to instruct his children. 
God's election through the Bible, if you pay attention, is based on his foreknowledge of their actions. It's based on, hey, why am I going to pick Paul the Apostle? Why am I going to pick Saul? Because I know he's going to be this great evangelist to go out and preach the gospel. That's why I'm going to pick him. That's why I chose him. Why did I pick these 12 disciples? And one's a devil? Yeah. He picked the devil on purpose. Because right. he knew he would betray him. Why did he pick the other 11 guys? Because he knew that they were going to go out and preach the gospel. It's not unconditional. It's based on how they're going to respond. And look, it's based on how you respond to the gospel that you're saved. Yeah. And that's the only condition upon salvation. But it is conditional. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. John chapter 6, verse 44. Here's another one of their famous quotes. No man can come to me except the Father, which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Yeah, but they never read Jesus when he said, And if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Look, Jesus Christ is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. That flies in the face of you know unconditional election. If God wants every single person to be saved, and trust me, he does, he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He, that's why he died on the cross for all their sins. If he wanted them to go to hell, why would he even send his son? He would just let us all die and go to hell. But he sent his son so that we wouldn't go to hell and that we'd go out and preach the gospel so that people could believe on him and be saved. But those that reject the gospel, that hate God, that don't want his free gift, they will go to hell and we'll see the wrath of God, that he's a powerful God. Yeah. How did you go to 1 Peter, right? Yep. Look at verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessing be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look, you were elect by the foreknowledge of Jesus Christ. Why did He love Jacob? Because He knew that He was going to serve the Lord. Why do you hate Esau? Because he wasn't going to follow in God's commandments. And now, obviously, if you, if you compare Scripture to Scripture, you'll see that when he's talking about those two people, he's really talking about the nations. Right. He's talking about Israel, and he's talking about Edom. But in just generality, he's saying, look, it's based on how you, you're going to respond. Uh, go, if you would, to, go if you would to Matthew chapter number 11. It says in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come in repentance. Look, He doesn't want us to perish, and He's not slack concerning His promise. The devil wants you to believe, though. The devil wants you to believe in unconditional election. Why? So then you just sit in church and think, well, all these people that are out of the church, they're not saved because if they were saved, they would come into church. They would seek God. They would be following all the commandments. And it's just this prideful, arrogant thing that has nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible makes it clear, look, we need to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. They don't know where they're going. They're not gonna, the lost person doesn't stumble into church. Look, you've got to find the lost person, get them found, and then bring them back into the fold. Bring them back into the sheep house. We see, look, the, the, the devil wants you to believe that it's not by choice. Because if it's not by choice, why would you go out and preach the gospel? Right. I mean, if you, if you have no possible impact on someone being saved, why would you ever go out and preach the gospel? If it's all of God, it's not of you, it's not of the guy you're preaching to, what's the point of even preaching the gospel? They try to make the gospel of none effect. They try to make the Bible of none effect. And you know what? When we go out and preach the gospel and get people saved, we're going to destroy this lie from hell, this Calvinist lie of unconditional election that John Piper and all his minions want to teach. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which are done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. You know what? God's a God of hypotheticals. There's all kinds of hypotheticals in the Bible. He says, look, if you would have done this, I would have blessed you, but you didn't, so now you're cursed. He's saying, look, hey, if someone had gone and preached the gospel and done mighty works for the Lord, look, these, these cities would have been saved. But nobody did it, and they were damned. You know, there's people going to hell every single day that could have been saved, 
if someone would preach from the gospel. That's right. there, God's a God of hypotheticals, and God gives man free will. He's not a robot maker like the Calvinists want you to believe. Oh, mm -mm, I just do what God told me to do. I have no choice. I am a robot. I can't preach gospel. No, I have free will. Jesus said in Psalms 119, Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. I say that because Jesus Christ is the Word of God. So anytime I say Jesus Christ, I say, hey, it's in the Bible. Hey, look, he wants the free will offerings of your mouth. How can a robot make a free will offering? It can't. It's like they think that God is like playing The Sims. There's this stupid computer game where you just like vicariously live through computer animated people and you just tell them what to do. You're like, hey, go walk outside. And, hey, get this job. And, hey, pick your nose and eat it. I mean, that's what they think God is. They think God is controlling all the actions of the world. But you know what the problem is with that? There's a lot of filth and wickedness right. that is in this world. Right. And if you believe that, then you believe every time a child molested, Every time someone's raped, every time someone gets drunk and beats their wife and their kids and, and kills all kinds of people, you think God did that. That's what the Calvinist believes. How wicked, how filthy. God is holy. God is righteous. There's no darkness in him at all. He is light. He is truth. And we need to destroy this lie that came out of hell. But you know what? By preaching the gospel. By preaching the condition of believing on Jesus Christ to be saved. It's not unconditional. It's trash. Here's the second point. We embrace unconditional election or damnable heresy because God designed it to make us fearless in our proclamation of His grace in a hostile world. What? Is, that's so stupid. Yeah. This guy doesn't even go soul winning. Right. Oh, I'm so fearless to go preach the gospel of damnable heresy. <laughs> that's stupid. Look, all that unconditional election makes you want to do is be lazy. Yeah. I mean, and you know what? I, I've had family members who justify their sins because of Calvinism. They say, well, you know, I got drunk because God wanted me to get drunk. Obvi I mean, obviously, if I did it, I mean, there's no recourse for your actions. Why would you even decide to do right? Because every time you do wrong, you're like, well, I guess God just wanted me to do that. I guess God just wanted me to commit fornication and never go to church and never read my Bible and never do anything right. Every decision in my mind is a mind game. I mean, I didn't even make that decision. God made it. How stupid. How foolish. Why would the Bible say in Romans chapter 12 we're supposed to renew our mind? If it's all just God just, you know, puppet, being a puppet master, just pulling all the strings, stupid. It says for his third point, we embrace unconditional election because God designed it to make us humble. It is not humble. It is the most prideful, yeah. arrogant, wicked doctrine because this is what they think. Why well, am living so righteously? That's why I'm saved. Yeah. They literally think that because they're living such a godly life, that's proof of their salvation. Because their last point is the perseverance of the saints. They say the only way to prove that you're saved is by realizing that you're living so holy, you must be saved. I mean, the only reason I've been making all these godly decisions is because, you know, I must be saved and God's just forcing me to live godly. It's such a prideful, arrogant, wicked lie. Look, the Bible says that we sin all the time. I mean, it says the thought of foolishness is sin. It says we should constantly strive to be perfect. We should constantly strive to follow God's commandments. That we have the, the battle of the old man. It just ruins the whole Bible. Yeah. Their fourth point is we embrace unconditional election because God made it a powerful moral impetus for compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. Look, I already told you, look, that's a lie. Most of the people I know are Calvinists. They justify their sins with their Calvinism. Saying, oh, God wanted me to do that. This fifth point, we embrace unconditional election because there's a powerful incentive in our evangelism to help unbelievers who are great sinners, not a spirit. This is just complete contrary to the truth. He says, uh, what will you say to God at judgment if you ask, why did you believe in my son while others didn't? He says, when you offer Christ freely to all unbelievers, suppose one says, I have sinned too terribly. God could never choose to save me. The most ultimate despair-destroying thing you can say to this person is, did you realize that God chose you before the foundation of the world, whom he will save? And he did it based on absolutely nothing in you. Before you were born, or had done anything good or bad, God chose whether to save you or not. Therefore, 
You dare not get in God's face and tell Him what qualifications you lack in order to be chosen. There are no qualifications for being chosen. So this is, he's just telling the guy, look, it's based on nothing that you do, no decision you make, not in your life. There's nothing you can just choose to be saved or not saved. So it just begs the question. The guy. So then it begs the question. He says. So the guy says, well, "What should I do?" <laughs> and he says, "Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved." That's how you begin to confirm your calling and election. If you will embrace the Savior, you will confirm that you're elect, and you'll be saved. But then they believe you have to persevere to the end to prove that you were really saved. Yeah. So it's like, well, if you're saved, you would believe. Because all those that would, you know, be chosen by God would believe and live a good life and follow all the commandments. So they basically just believe in their works as proof of their salvation. Yeah. And it's so stupid. It's like an afterthought. It's like, well, God already chose if you're going to be saved or not. Do you believe in Jesus? No? Oh, you weren't saved. You weren't chosen. Must not be chosen then because you didn't. No reason to compel them to believe, yeah. to give them the fear of God, right. to tell them there's a hell, to tell them they have a choice, to tell them that God loves them and wants them to be saved. No, hey, God might have chosen you to just go to hell, buddy. Do you believe? Oh, I guess He just chose you to go to hell. I guess God just hates you. What a damnable heresy. What a lie. We need to go out and destroy that with the gospel. Yeah. Destroy that with Romans Road. Destroy that by preaching, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not maybe. Look, every person that believes on Jesus Christ will be saved. His last point was, we need to share this on Facebook. Well, there's the one thing I'm going to do for you, John Piper. I'm sharing it on Facebook right now. You lying devil. I hope you die. And guess what? God might have known that you were going to go to hell because you were never going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But guess what? All of us, we have a choice and we're going to believe on Jesus Christ. Go if you would to Acts chapter 2. For sake of time, I have to go a little bit faster through this. Actually, go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. Now, the third point of my sermon is that we need to slay. What are we going to slay? There's another lie out there called repent of your sins. That you have to be saved. You have to repent of all your sins. You must turn from your sins to, and then turn to the Savior. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't even use the, the phrase repent of your sins one time. Why in the world would God give you this huge book of how to be saved and it doesn't even use the phrase that you're supposed to get saved one time? I mean, you have to repent of your sins. It's never even in the Bible one time. But there's this huge proponent of it, Ray Comfort. This guy is an enemy to soul winning. Why? Well, if you go to independent Baptist churches today, you'll find his tracks littered all over the counter. You'll find all kinds of people in his church using all those gimmicks and tricks and phony, you know, counterfeits to the giving of the gospel. Like what? Well, he has these things like million dollar bills. What? Why in the world would I be giving somebody a million dollar bill to try and get them saved? The love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, the people that are really excited about that million dollar bill, I mean... They need the gospel, but man, that's not the right spirit I want to conjure up before I'm going to get them, try and get them saved. And they have people on their million dollar bills instead of like Abraham Lincoln or somebody. They have Santa Claus. A Santa Claus million dollar bill is your gimmick to getting them saved? Or how about a Halloween million dollar bill? They have like a witch or they have some kind of goblin on a million. You're using that to get somebody saved? <laughs> Why would you not use the Bible? I mean, what are we going to think of next? Let's use Ouija boards. I mean, what? This guy's an idiot. Amen. You know, they have another one, a smartphone track, where they just make a bunch of jokes on the front. Because, yeah, it's real funny, I guess. And then on the back, he kind of gives you a, a gospel. He starts out by saying how you wouldn't... He starts on the front by saying you're not going to look on the back. And then he looks, and you turn on the back and says, I told you. What? You couldn't help yourself. But the odds are you will stop reading this because this is about God. I know I'm right about this. What in the world? This guy's like trying to stop them from reading the gospel by using reverse psychology? So stupid. But he says, okay, so I was wrong. But I'm not wrong about this. So we've already established this guy's a liar. Yeah. He, he just admits that he's a liar. That's how I'm going to start with the gospel. Yeah. He says, but I'm not wrong about this. You have to face God on Judgment Day. And he considers... Lust to be adultery, hatred to be murder, and he warns that all liars will end up in hell. 
That's how serious sin is to God. Have you lied, lusted, even once, stolen, or used God's name in vain? If you have, you'll be guilty on Judgment Day and end up in a terrible place called, in quotes, hell. <laughs> now, what in the world? In quotes, hell? That in implies that there isn't really a hell. Right. No, there is a hell. It's not in quotes in the Bible. It's an ex a real place that people burn and are tormented. I don't want to make a mock of hell. No, it's a real place. I don't want people to go there. It says, however, the Bible says that God is rich in mercy. And His great kindness provided the Savior. Jesus took the punishment for the sin of the world. He suffered on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And He rose from the dead and defeated death to receive everlasting life as a free gift. Repent. <laughs> Turn from all sin. <laughs> and trust alone in Jesus Christ. Hey, do you want this free gift? Or we have to be perfect. <laughs> you have to do everything right. You have to get all the sin. You have to stop drinking. You have to stop fornicating. You have to come to church three times a week. You have to read and pray. And you can't even have a foolish thought. Don't even have a foolish thought. Free gift. Free gift I'm handing out. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants your stupid gimmick. Nobody wants your stupid phone track. It's garbage. Hey, you hand a child one of those fake phones. They just throw it down. They're like, I want the real thing. They even know what a real thing is. And look, these gospel tracts are phonies. They're lies. That's not the gospel. Repenting of your sins has nothing to do with being saved. Amen. Nobody can even do that. So stupid. See, this Ray Comfort, you know, he won't even deny it. I made some stupid video attacking him, saying that he was preaching and repenting of your sins is a false gospel. And it got a lot of views. It got like a quarter million views. And so he decided to make a response video. He made a response video and he's saying, look, there's these people that call me a heretic because I believe in repentance. But, you know, repentance is really true because Charles Spurgeon said that repentance and faith are inseparable. And because William Booth of the Salvation Army, he says that America, you know, it's going to be a, a sad day when they forget about repentance. Why wouldn't you even quote the Bible? Right. I mean, is that your source of authority? Is Charles Spurgeon your source of authority? Mm -hmm. Some dead preacher that was, you know, said all kinds of things. He basically said everything. So you can basically get a quote from Charles Spurgeon and say whatever you want. Because he just talked out of both sides of his mouth the whole time. Yeah. It's hard to believe that the guy was saved. Right. But look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. They'll say, well, yeah, but it's biblical. So then he miss, you know, interprets a couple of verses. Acts 2, 38, it says you've got to repent of your sins. Well, we're not going to find it, but let's read what it says. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, comma, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now here's my question. Let's say that that did say repent of your sins. Let's go with their stupid folly for a minute, okay? Acts chapter 2 says this. Let's read it again. Then Peter said unto them, Repent of your sins, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if that's what that said, then the, the requirements of salvation are turning from your sins and being baptized. Yeah. Now my question is, where's the faith? Mm -hmm. Are we saved by believing on Jesus Christ? Isn't it believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? He'll even say you have to do two things to be saved. You have to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Well my question is, if repent there means of your sins, where was the faith? He's saying, hey, here's a great example of how to be saved. It has no faith in it, though. It has no believing. That's because it's a lie. The repent there is the faith. Yeah. The repent there is the believing on Jesus Christ. These Jews that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not believe on Him, He's saying, look, what do we need to do? You need to repent doing what? Stop believing that Jesus was not the Savior and believe that He's the Savior. That's how you're going to get saved. And after you get saved, you know what you should do? Get baptized. Yeah. But being baptized isn't what saves us. That makes The Bible makes it super clear. It's just the public profession of what? The fact that you repented. Yep. That you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The person that has never believed on Jesus Christ, you know what they need to do? They need to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. Amen. Look, I'm all for preaching repentance when it comes to salvation. But let's, let's clear up what we mean by it. What does it mean to repent? It means to change your mind. And look, every single person that's ever believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they repented of something because they had a change of mind. They went from unbelief to belief on Jesus Christ. Or they went from believing in Allah to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or they went most commonly from believing in themselves to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they needed to repent and believe the gospel. 
That's what it said in Mark chapter 1. It says, repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus went out preaching. Not repent of your sins. Not clean up your life. No. Stop trusting in anything other than me to get you to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Right. So hey, look, every single time someone believed on Jesus Christ, they repented. I'm all for preaching repentance, but not of your sins. That's a lie. That has no basis in Scripture. It's never mentioned even one time. They'll use Acts chapter 17. Oh, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Amen. Amen. They need to stop trusting in idols and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't say of your sins, though. No. It doesn't, he didn't go up to all these idol worshippers and saying, Look, you got to clean up your drinking. You've got to get all the sin out of your life if you want to be saved. He's saying, look, you need to stop trusting all these dumb idols, all these stupid rocks. You really think that's what the God is like? You really think when God made you in the image of God, a man, that, he, that God is like the stupid rock? Yeah. Are you not better than the stupid rock? Than all these dumb idols? You can walk and talk and breathe and make decisions? Sorry, Calvinist. Yes, you can make decisions. You have free will. You're not a rock. You're not just subject to somebody to pick you up and throw you. That's what the Calvinists believe. Oh, you're just this dumb rock that God picks up and just throws and casts away and does whatever he wants with. No. You have value. And look, we need to repent. Every person needs to repent of what? Their unbelief of whatever they're trusting that's not Jesus Christ and believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. It's a one-time event. Go if you would my my last point. Let's go to uh, let's go to Matthew twenty one. So what do we need to do? We need to fight. We need to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to get in the battle because if we don't go to battle, look, the enemies are working day and night to tear down the Bible. The enemies are constantly going against the Bible. You know, I was gonna have, I I told you to turn to Second Samuel chapter number twenty three. The Bible talks about a man who his hand, when it was weary, it still clave to the King James Bible. I mean the sword. The sword, the God's Word, it just clave to it and he kept slaying. We need to use God's Word and when we get weary, just, just hold on tight and go out and keep preaching. Keep battling. Keep fighting. Keep slaying the enemies. Keep destroying Calvinism and all its lies and demon, you know, darkness. We need to slay all this repent of your sins trash. When we go out, we're going to run into people that say, hey, I, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. You know what we're going to do? We're going to slay it with the Word of God. We're going to slay it with the Bible. We're going to open up God's Word and show them, hey, the Bible says it's just by believing. Acts chapter 16 says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We're going to slay all these lying heresies when we go out and we preach the gospel. But you know what? When you sit at home, you're not doing anything. You know what? You're not fighting. When you're not gathering with Christ, you're scattering abroad. Right. And the enemies are constantly working to, to damn more people to hell. We need to go out and fight against that yeah. by preaching the gospel, yeah. by shedding the light. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to destroy, we're going to slay, and we're going to cause to perish. That's my last point. What's going to cause to perish? All the lame Baptists that won't go out so winning. That won't go out and preach the gospel. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, Remember therefore from where, whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. It says, look, churches that will not go out and preach the gospel, God will cause you to perish. He will remove your candlestick. He will remove your light. It says in 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Look, hey, there's a lot of churches that might have done a lot of good things. They might have started a good movement. But guess what? If you don't step fast in the faith, if you're not going out and continuing to preach the gospel, you might lose that which you wrought. You might lose that which you built up. That church that you built up by all your great soul winning and all your great efforts in the past, you might lose that if you don't continue in the faith, if you don't continue to fight, if you don't continue to go out and preach the gospel. Matthew 21, verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Why did the Israelites perish? Because they were not the light that God wanted to be the light of the Gentiles. He says, look, I'm going to take it from you. 
Look, when you don't go out and do the works, God will take that which you have. You unprofitable servant, you wicked servant, you slothful servant. We know that the Bible says. It says in Luke chapter 13, verse 6, He spake also of this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down! Why cumbereth it the ground? And you say, well, what's the point of these churches perishing? Well, you know what they're doing? They're cumbering the ground. They're taking good Christians that would go soul winning, and they're just sucking all the nutrients up and doing nothing with them. Amen. They have all these people that would go out and preach the gospel, that would do the work of the Lord, that would get people saved, and we need those stupid trees to just get plucked up from the ground so that all those people get into a good church and go out sowing and do the work of the Lord so those nutrients can actually produce some fruit. Go out and do, preach the gospel. And you know what? I don't want any of these churches to fail. I don't want any of these churches to perish. I hope that they all get revived. I hope they can get dunked by God's word and then they can start producing some fruit. Because we need more people on our side. We need more people to go out and preach the gospel. But it's a warning from the Bible that those that just refuse to do the soul refuse to preach the gospel, God will cause them to perish. You know what? When we go out and we preach the gospel in this whole country and people see us doing our great works, we're shining our light so that men can see our good works, guess what? All the good people are going to leave those churches. And these bad churches, they're going to perish. They're going to be caused to perish. Look, there's only two churches, basically. God's church and the fun center. Yep. All the unsaved people are going to go to the fun center. All the righteous people, they're going to want to go to the tree that's producing the fruit. Because they're going to get hungry. And they want to go where God's people are. Look at Matthew 21, verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned in the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. But leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon? is the fig tree withered away. You know what? I think when we start doing these great exports for the Lord, when we go out and we battle on the 31st, it's going to be a quick transition for the churches that decide not to do the soul winning. Mm -hmm. Decide not to serve the Lord. Decide not to live for God. This is a warning. If you're a Baptist church, if you believe the gospel, you better go out and start preaching the gospel or God will take away your church. He'll cause you to perish. You know what? I hope all the lame Christians do perish. I hope they all dry up. Why? So they stop wasting people's lives. Yeah. There's so many people at one of the churches I was going to that would go out and preach the gospel and they weren't doing it because nobody was guiding them. Because right. nobody was commanding them, hey, look, the Bible says you need to go out and preach the gospel. The Bible says that it's a command of God. The Bible makes it clear it's the first love. The Bible makes it clear that's the point why you're on this even this earth. Is to be a, a preacher of the gospel. Everybody can be a preacher of the gospel. Young boy, young lady, young man, old man. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been from, what you've done, what your life is. If you're saved and you've got a King James Bible in your hand, you can do great works for God. You can go out and cause to destroy Calvinism. You can slay the repent of your sins. You know what? You can cause to perish all these lame, weak Baptists that won't go out and fight. You know what? You can stir up the people that do want to fight to come with you. You can stand your ground and you can cause other people to stand with you, to fight with you, to fight that good fight of faith. We see that we need men to stand. You know, you're going to help recruit more soul winners. In Esther, we read in Esther at the end of Esther chapter 8, it says, And in every province, in every city, where the story of the king's commandment and the decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. When they went out and they slaughtered all their enemies, when they did these, this great battle, a lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to get on board with the Jews. Look at what they're doing. Look at the good works they're doing. It's important that you get involved. It's important that you go out and fight. Look, Mordecai and Esther could not save all the people by themselves. They needed every person in every part of the land and all the provinces to say, I'm going to take a stand on this day. I'm going to go out and attack the enemies. You know what's the best defense against sin in your life? A good offense. You want to get the sin out of your life? Go out and preach the gospel. 
You want to get the sin in your life? Read the Bible. Go to church. If you, if you get zealous for God, if you're going on the offense, it's going to be a good defense in your life. Let's close in prayer.